if you feel like there is a shortage of Bible class teachers. Everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. I literally, uh, my coordinators laugh at me quite often for multiple reasons, but they laugh at me specifically because every meeting I'm like, pray that some Bible class teachers will move in the town. You know, pray. You know, and I like, be specific. I need some adult teachers. I need some preschool, nursery teachers. You know, I'm specific. And so pray for that. And so, again, a big issue that a lot of congregations run into is a shortage of teachers. And as I've talked with them over the last, you know, 10 plus years, here's some of the things that they say that would encourage them. Number one, they need good resources. Uh, as I shared the story earlier about that kindergarten teacher saying that she needed help, as I opened that file cabinet, it was just this hodgepodge all over the place. One week the kids would be learning about the Ten Commandments, and then it would go to Peter denying Jesus, and then it would go to Revelation, and then it would go back to creation. It was all over the place. And so give them good resources. So, And I will get to the ones that we use, okay? But give them good resources. That will encourage them. We want to make it super easy. Uh, as I explained earlier, I highly recommend having a scope and sequence. Even as ministers, when you plan a sermon series out, you need to know where you're going. It eliminates a lot of the stress. Instead of getting up going, okay, what am I going to teach on today, right? There's something about knowing where you're going. I will go from here. I will go over here. I will stop. When I head home, I'm going to get fuel. I'm going to go. I'm going to hit the first Bucky's, and then I'm going to hit the second Bucky's, and then I'm going to hit the third Bucky's before I get home. That's how I operate, okay? Even got my photo made with the second Bucky's because he was really, really tall. And so, but you know where you're going, and it eliminates a lot of stress. One of the things when I get invited to speak somewhere that gives me the most anxiety, they're like, just, just teach on whatever you want. What do you mean teach on whatever? You see? What do you mean teach on what I want? I don't know if any of my lessons are any good, and you want me to pick from that? Versus, hey, we want you to speak on being wise. Now I know where I'm going, right? And so you want to be specific with that. Make sure there is plenty of curriculum. When I got to Louisville, they literally would give one page. This was a whole thing, and you were supposed to fill 40 minutes with about that much material. Uh, and it's like, no, we, we don't operate that. You know, we, we need more resources, so expand upon that. I am not big on coloring sheets. I'm just going to tell you. At Louisville, a coloring sheet will be a warm-up as kids are coming in, or it will be a cool-down at the end. I do not, I'm in the camp that does not believe that coloring pages is teaching them the Bible. To me, it's just busy work versus having them actually engage and be part of what's going on. Uh, teens and adults, uh, good materials to aid them in their lesson prep. And so as I talk about in our next session, I literally brought materials that I like, both of the church and those not of the church. Uh, but I want to make sure that they get plenty of resources. Because when they have plenty of resources, their stress and anxiety goes down. They're able to study and do a better job. A uh, couple hours per week to prepare is all that I ask, especially of our adult teachers. You know, if you can give me an hour and a half to two hours, man, that's great. I can tell you, for me to write a lesson, I spend anywhere from 8 to 12 hours per lesson. But I also know I have the flexibility that a lot of people don't who are tent makers, per se, right? Who have careers and who have jobs. One of the things that I'd also suggest, and you may have them, I don't know, but spend $400 and get you a 55-inch TV, and then spend you another $100 and get you the roller cart that goes with it. They're amazing, especially with your concrete floors. You can roll them in and out, okay? And then you can just allow individuals to come in. They have their TV that's set up there in the room. They can wheel it to that wall or that wall or wherever they need to go. Laptops, you can get a really good one for about $400 as well. And so I want to make sure, especially with our teens and our adults, and I'll talk about why a little bit more later, <clears throat> that they have access to technology. They have access to technology. Nothing against flannel graphs. I know they've taught a lot of people for a long time. But there's newer stuff out there, too, okay, that you can access and get. Uh, require, um, let's see, I'm jumping ahead here. Actually, I'm going to put them all up there so you can write them all down, and then I'll, I'll go over it. 
And so take some things off their plate. You know, I talked about the co-coordinators, uh, and that is why it's so important. If you're asking somebody, look, you figure out your curriculum, you gather your curriculum, you cut out your, your, uh, your, your craft, and you do all this, it becomes overwhelming. And so for us to get teachers, as I've expressed, we have everything set up by pulling in people who may not be teachers so that as the teacher comes into the classroom, it's there and it's ready to go. I told you that I would bring one of our pizza kits, and here it is. I'm doing live stream, so I have to stay behind the mic. But this is our three-year-old curriculum. This is, uh, well, it's right here. This is summer, uh, Sunday morning, week six. It says right here. If you come into our threes class, you will have your little thing that you're going to go through here by taking them to the story. You are going to have a copy of the overview of all the lesson worksheets. I mean, you get the idea. I mean, this is one Sunday morning lesson. Nod your head if you know what I'm getting at without me having to go through everything. This is one lesson. So if you're a teacher, even if I say, hey, we need you to fill in for us, sure, I'll be happy to do it. Guess what? You can go over there, you can pull this out, look at it in five minutes, you got it. Now, do you think if you are a teacher who isn't sure what to do, let's say you're young or you're inexperienced, don't you think if you have a kit like this, you can figure it out real quick? You see my point? But whenever we come in and we say, look, go teach a, go, go entertain our kindergartners, and this is all you give them, they don't want to teach. They don't want to teach. And so it's going to be a real struggle. And then you may start feeling some anxiety right now. And the truth of the matter is, rightfully so. Because it's a lot of work. If I forget that, I'm dead. Okay? You cannot touch that. Um, but anyway, it's a lot of work. But that's why you've got to get everyone involved. Right, And I would even encourage, let me start at one quarter at a time. I mean, you understand you have the whole pie. Instead of focusing on the whole pie, maybe you say, all right, I believe in the wooden bucket method. The lowest slat of a wooden bucket is the max water it'll hold. Does that make sense to you? But if you shore up that slat of that wooden bucket, what happens? Everything gets better. And so what we did is we started with our twos curriculum, which I have over here, and that was our lowest slat. But I wanted to make sure there was enough there. We just kept building on it, and we focused on one quarter at a time, one grade at a time. And amazingly, over time, it happens. And with a group like this, there's no reason that you as a group collectively couldn't work on two quarters at the same time. As long as you have your scope, what you're studying, sequence, what each week is, not if you're with me. If not, please interrupt me because you have to understand this. What's going on? But build your pizza kit, okay? Also have it there, get them a co-teacher. It has been my experience that if I say, will you teach this class? Ooh. Because we live in a time in which people travel a lot. And to say, will you commit for 13 weeks? Ooh. Well, I may be gone three weeks, and therefore, no, I'm out. No, but if I say, hey, will you two guys together, could you give me six lessons? Well, yeah, I can do six. Can you give me six lessons? Yeah, I can do six because we have a guest speaker coming in to do that 13th week, if it makes sense. I will even get to the point, especially with my auditorium class, in which uh, I will say, can you give me a month, a month, and a month? And I, they almost always say yes, right? So the idea that I have to do something for 13 weeks and it's only me, please throw that out. Now, there are some of you that enjoy that, and that's great. I'm not saying you have to change, but what I'm saying is if you want to broaden your teacher pool, find creative ways. Find creative ways to do that. Plan ahead, duh, okay? <laughs> you know, plan ahead. If you are uh, a procrastinator, uh, you need to be partnered with somebody who is not. Is that kind? Okay, you need to be partnered with somebody who is not. Provide teaching breaks. So again, uh, as I was having to destroy this idea of once you uh, volunteer, you're stuck in there for life. What we do at Louisville, if you take Sunday morning, Wednesday night, four quarters a year, okay, with me, total of eight quarters, all I allow our teachers to do is two quarters a year. Because they need to be fed in order to go feed, right? 
They need to be fed in order to go feed. And so that's what we'll do. Now, if you have somebody that's just dying, well, that's fine. But you need to make sure that they're being taken care of. Because what I've also found is that if you, if they're like, no, this is what I have to do. Da, 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 okay. And then all of a sudden they come to me, I'm just burned out. Well, I know you need a break. We all need a break. I even allow myself a break. You know, one, basically I teach seven of the quarters a year, if that makes sense. I get off one. I hope you get off one. Right? He didn't tell me to say that. Elders, make sure he at least has one quarter that he can take a break. Right? Because we need to be able to refeed ourselves so that we can give. Okay? Provide teaching breaks, teaching frequency. Again, I've talked about out of our eight, uh, I shoot for two quarters. Here, looking around, you know, maybe it is you, if you can give me three quarters and I'll give you off the other five. You know, figure out what works for you that makes sense. But people need a break. But what I've also found is not only is that for the teacher, but it's also for those prospective teachers. Look, man, I'm just so busy. I understand that. Can you give me six weeks? Just give me six weeks out of the year. Well, yeah, because I want to partner you with, so and so, you know, with, with somebody else, and they're going to take care of the other. Y'all go in there together. And next thing you know, they find out because you've got made everything so easy on them that they want to continue to be involved. I'm going to pause. Question. I'm not that good, but thank you. All right. <laughs> Developing future teachers. Okay, I talked about things we do with our team. I think I printed off 30 or 40. Uh, if I can get a volunteer or two to hand these out, or I guess I can just send them down the table. I don't know if y'all are involved in LTC. Oh, question? Yes, ma'am. So that's where the I work with the class coordinators. We'll sit down and figure out what do we want to do. Okay. Then once we figure out what, because I, I lay out the, the scope and sequence. I lay out what study we're doing. Okay. Then we will go and just start finding people in the congregation to help us with it. So I literally, as we were writing some new curriculum, I can't remember the, the grade right now. I think it was our four-year-olds. Um, that's where I, I got up on Sunday morning. If you can sew, if you are artsy craftsy, meet me in the library at such and such time. I already had the 13 lessons all printed out. Look, here's a Bible class lesson. I need your help, your creative ability to come up with some kind of craft something to reinforce this lesson, and they grabbed it and they ran with it. I came up with a little grasshopper for the plague using the uh, tube of in the middle of toilet paper rolls in which you had the little foam legs and made a little grasshopper, and that's the only thing cool I've ever done, okay? And they still use it, but that's where you get on Pinterest, right? You get on Pinterest and you type in whatever that Bible class lesson is, and there is a flood of ideas, but if you feel like, hey, coordinator, it's 100% on you, you're going to have coordinators quit. But that's where you get up, or you know, the coordinators get together. Hey, I'm looking for this. You have an announcement made on Sunday morning. Hey, we're looking for some artsy, crafty people because we're working on our kindergarten curriculum. Does that make that sense? Okay. All right, so there is LTC and there is Lads to Leaders, okay? Similar but different. Lads to Leaders is, uh, has a program called Teach to Teach. You can read. I'm not going to read that form to you, okay? If you lose it, you can go to their website, Lads to Leaders Convention Manual, and you can find all of that. What we do, my wife actually runs that segment, is we find out what middle school and high schoolers want to be involved, uh, but at the same time, we will allow college age, young moms, whatever it may be, and... But with our teens, we will actually go in, and they're to do a total of 12 weeks. But I don't want to take them out of their Bible class for 12 solid weeks. So what I'll do is I will put them either winter, summer, or spring, fall, and they'll do six weeks in maybe the uh, pre-K fours class. And then the next time, they may be with a different teacher in the third grade class, right? I give them a little bit of experience with the younger ages, but also the older, you know, the uh, uh, elementary ages. 
And so, and once they go in there, they will get a binder. Here's our kindergarten binder. This is not the kit that's in the file cabinet back home. But they will get a binder just like the teachers. And we figure out week one, man, they are just there to observe. Week two, they're there to observe. Week three, why don't you cover this little segment here? We want to basically, it's like the twins. We want to give a little spoon feed, right? You don't want to throw them off the deep end, but we just want to give them a little bit, a little bit, and a little bit. And then they do that for six weeks, increasing it a little bit each time. The teacher will work with the students and say, hey, what, what questions did you have? I really liked how you did A, B, C. Hey, uh, next time, and this is a big one if you do this, teens, your phones are to be put away. Put phones away, okay? But you want to have this mentoring process. But again, it's kind of like boiling a frog. You've heard this before. You just want to put them in there and just turn the heat up, and then they'll get more and more, except you don't want to kill the kid, okay? But you just want to increase the heat. You want to have them do a little bit more each and every week. And so we do the same thing even with our adults. We start them off, hey, this quarter, will you just come in and just be an assistant? You don't have to teach. And just, just come in and assist. And so if they'll come in and assist, next thing you know, they find out, well, it's not as hard as I thought. Right? Their, their fears are lowered. All of a sudden, it's like, hey, I can do that. And so they go through. And so the teach to teach is, is, uh, is definitely something that we do. Again, you can read it. Uh, but I can tell you by the end of our third year, like right now on Wednesday night, first grade, we have a kid, uh, Zoe's her name, who just graduated high school. She's teaching the class all by herself. Because our goal is by the time they go off to college, they can bless the congregations where they're at while they're in college, but also have this, the uh, self-esteem and the know how to do it once they uh, settle in somewhere. Okay, So again, figure out what works for you. Uh, I am in the process, I haven't done it yet, of doing something with our adults, especially our men, in which I'll give you the high-level high concept in which you will have a three, which is your seasoned vet teachers. Okay, you will have your twos, individuals that can teach but need a little bit of help. Okay, a little bit of mentoring. And your level ones who have little to no experience. All three of them have the same binder. The level two will teach in this class. For us, we have five adult classes on Sunday morning. They will go in and they will teach their lesson in this class. When class is over, the one, two, and three will get together. The three will say, I really like how you did this and this and this. But next time, maybe don't spend as much time, don't get bogged down here or ask this question, you know, give some, some input, right? While the level one is sitting there taking notes and figuring out. And then week two, they shift. They teach the same lesson. They shift. Week three, same lesson, shift. And then week four, they better have that lesson and be fine-tuned after you've taught that lesson four weeks in a row. It's the idea. Right, and that one is there is part of that dialogue and that conversation, and then after so much time, then the level one maybe they take a segment of it. Again, we've just got to start training uh, on that, and so we want to develop co-teaching and mentoring. I just went over that. Uh, again, having individuals that are willing to take a bite of the pie is better than having nobody even taste the pie. Right, have everybody take a little portion of it and to work on that and to develop it, and you'll be a, a, a whole lot better. Uh, just talked about that. Sunday afternoon pop-up refreshers. So uh, kind of what you're doing now in essence. Uh, but what I will do is I will try to find someone. Normally, it is tied into someone who's involved in the local school system. Or maybe it's someone who is a really good teacher, instructor at a uh, homeschool co-op. And we'll just come in, and we'll have our normal worship, and then we will have a meal like you just did, and then they'll get up, and they'll give a session or two, right? Just presenting some new concepts, some new teaching strategies, sharing some new resources, right? We used to have, I remember growing up, you would have teacher's workshops, right? Where I'm at now, I don't know of any. Why? Because they weren't being attended. So instead of trying to get people to go somewhere else and attend their workshop, what I try to do is to bring somebody in and just talk to our people. 
and just give them, again, give them some new concepts, give them some new ideas. Talk to your people, talk to your church family. Everybody knows somebody or has heard of somebody that may lead you to somebody else, right? They can help you with that. Um, so here is another handout. Whenever I got this, anybody heard of Marcia Tate? Okay. Marcia Tate, I'm going to make sure I'm on my right slide here. Yeah, I'm not. I'm jumping all over the place. That's all right. That's what I want to show you. So I want to hand this out. So my wife went to a conference. That's what they do is they send my wife all over to get trained on how to teach teachers. this one the eight steps okay you can turn it over in a little bit but we're not there yet okay so you want to talk about greeting the participants okay now let me be very clear this was written for public education so when you see me say play music don't be like Ugh. okay there's praise and harmony people relax but you can get the ideas and so when they talk about how do we go about teaching children, this is something that was summarized by Marcia Tate uh, to allow them to be uh, effective, more effective in teaching. So one of the things that I'm doing now that frankly I don't like doing, I call it, I am the sage on the stage. What I mean by that is, quote unquote, most of our Bible classes are conducted in a way in which I'm the one who, under this, I'm the one who has studied this subject. I am the so-called expert on this subject at this particular time, and I am regurgitating or sharing the information I've learned. Sage on the stage, okay? What is real big in public education is what they call the uh, the scribe or the uh, the scribe on the side. In other words, it's not about just blah 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 talking head, but it's about getting you to interact, you to talk. Even in our auditorium class, uh, I will go through and I may teach for uh, 18 to 20 minutes, and then I will say, I call it turning talk. All right, I want you to turn to the person next to you. Here's the question. I want you two or three. I want you to take 10 minutes. I want you to discuss it. Once we're done, be seated, and then I'm going to ask what did each group come up with. They love it. I mean, they love it. Because especially in Bible class, they want to be able to talk about it. You know, they, they sit through a sermon, right? We sit there and we've been quiet. But in a Bible class, we have thoughts, we have ideas. And so that's what she talks about. She talks about greeting the participants, right? Uh, I mean, being up there and being involved, right? And I know in our children's classes, I'm, I'm sure we do this well. Two, choose a goal. Clearly state the goal, revisit the goal, and communicate the goal in advance. In other words, what is the one thing I want these kids to walk away with today? What I want them to understand is Jesus genuinely loves them. And so everything that we do is to stress that one point. Three, consider a handout. Notice this, those of you who teach adults. Adults as well as children can take notes and effectively listen at the same time. Right? I hope so, since all of you have notepads there. Right? And so they can take notes. Uh, one of the things that I've learned, especially those of you who work with teens, is I was raised where you need to make eye contact with me when I was speaking with you. My son struggles to make eye contact. In fact, he loves King David. He's over here reading about King David, but he can tell you everything being said in the sermon. I can't do that, but he does. And so you've got this, this idea of being able to take notes. Be a butterfly. Move around the room. Use proximity control, especially if you use teens. It's funny. Imagine you've got a teenager here that's cutting up with his friends. I don't have to say a word. I will go up and just get behind them and just keep teaching my lesson. And all of a sudden, you can imagine the hair on the back of their neck is standing up. And it's amazing. They quiet down. Right? But use that proximity control. Five, don't plan for a sit and get. Again, lecture is not going to cut it. Marcia Tate's 20 engagement strategies, which is on the back. Uh, Hands-on activities, interactive as possible. Uh, what I will talk about... Again, I, I basically forgot my PowerPoint. I'm just going, if you can't tell, is clump your lessons, right? Every 15 minutes, I am changing up what I'm doing. I may physically, hey, we're over here, and this is where we're just going to talk about 
uh, I may tell you the story over here. Just verb, just from what I, man, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And then we may, then I say, all right, guys, come over here to this corner. And over here in this corner, I have them watch a, a, a video about the lesson I just taught. And then I'm going to say, all right, now everybody sit down over here and turn and talk. And, and what's something cool that you saw? Next thing you know, they're cutting up and interacting and all this stuff. And then I may move over here and, and do an interactive game with them or something. And then I may have them all sit down again and say, hey, what is something that you learned today that you didn't know before you came in? It's about constantly keeping them moving, constantly changing up your teaching style and everything that you're doing. That's what she's talking about here. Number six, partner with your coach. That's where you just have somebody uh, that you respect. Hey, help me. What are some cool ideas I can come up with, plan, present, PowerPoint tips? Please do not read your PowerPoint word for word. I have an individual that is a good teacher. I don't know what's going on with him. He literally reads his entire Bible class lesson right now. Our auditorium class is normally 130 people. Right now there's 20. He has killed the class because all he does is read. And all the participants are like, I can read. You know, you should already know it by then. 28-point font, you can talk here to find out what size works here in your auditorium and then get feedback, etc. Any questions on that? Am I doing okay? Yes. I think it's for all ages. Absolutely. I mean, you have to, I mean, if you walk in and we're playing praise and harmony music, y'all may be like, what's going on? You know, I mean, use your discretion. But absolutely, I mean, mingling, I mean, coming in. I don't know if you saw when I was done with the sermon, I intentionally went over here and talked to the teens on purpose. All right? Because they were paying attention. Now, the rest of them may not be any good, but those four boys did really well today. You know, that's a joke. Don't get offended, okay? Right? But I wanted to go over there and, and talk to them, right? Mingle. Choose a goal. What's the one point you want people to understand? Right? I, I, I use this for all ages. So, but again, figure out what works for your style. Good question. Oh. So I, we have, and I'm sure you do too here, we have some very, very sharp kids. And I tell the Bible class teachers, especially the middle school teachers, if you try to fake it, they will eat your lunch. You better know your stuff. It's better to send them to the auditorium and not meet that, that, that time than for you to go to that class and wing it. And so, yeah, they do know. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I just went over all that. That's good. All right. I don't know what's up. There we go. All right. This is going to make me sound bad. In all of our ages... We unofficially label all of our teachers into one of these three categories. And you're going to know what I'm talking about. There are growers. You can put them in a Bible class, and everybody in the church loves to hear brother so-and-so speak. And so uh, you can put them in the class, and next thing you know, you can have a class. I'm going to grab numbers here. I can have a class that is uh, 40 people. And by the end of the quarter, it will be up to 70 because that teacher does an incredible job. Then you have those that if the class is 40 at the beginning of the quarter, at the end of the quarter, it's going to be around 40. They're just a main thing. And then there's this third category that nobody wants to publicly discuss, but we all know, which is the class killers. That is, every time you find out, oh, brother so-and-so's teaching, oh. I, I appreciate brother so-and-so, right? You, you have these conversations. It, it, tell me I'm wrong. Right? You have these conversations in the car. That's what I tell my kids, in the car. But that, in the car, you know, in the car is holy, right? We can say whatever we want, right? In the car, okay? So when I got to Louisville, and I, they know this, you know who my killers were? Our elders. 
Because our elders, okay? Now, y'all don't have that problem here, right? See, there we go. Good answer. Okay. So it was our elders. And so then as education minister, I have a decision to make. Well, I can't put them in a class because they'll kill it. But yet, do they know the Bible? Yes. Do they love teaching? Yes. Do they love people? Yes. So how do I put them in a position to succeed? You want to know where I found out to put most of our elders? Fifth grade. Crazy as it sounds. Because here you have these elders, and they come in, they're like, fifth grade? And I'm like, look, it's an energetic group, but they're excited. And they come in, and I, every elder will come out, and they're like, I love that class. Because in fifth grade, for us, it's all of your doctrinal basic stuff. We'll spend a quarter on the church. We'll spend a quarter on salvation. We'll spend a, a quarter on, you know, whatever, right? And so it's just the one-on-one of Christian doctrine if you will well they've, they've heard it their whole life they know it i've got really good curriculum for them and so i just go in there and i'm like look just go in there here's the fill in the blank outline just go in there and interact with them and it's amazing because i not only do i use them there but they teach the same subject that quarter year after year after year after year after year so they're comfortable with their material and so it is always funny, about right now, my winter teacher, excuse me, this is, yeah, we're in fall quarter. My winter teachers will come up to me, elders that is, hey, are you going to let me teach that class again? Yeah, I am. So I think it's important that we don't just write somebody off. But I think we have to get creative and think, where can I put everyone to succeed? God has given every one of us gifts and abilities some more than others in different areas, right? But we need to find opportunity to get them in there, allow them to plug in, and to do good things. So myself and uh, the elders that I work with and my deacon over adult ed, we come in and talk, you know, well, I go grower, maintainer, or, and they're like, or, right? How do we, wh where do we need to put them? What's their teaching style? They're a lecturer. Then I can't have them with our young families. I can't have them with our college. I can't have them da 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 da. But will they work in the auditorium? Some people work better in the auditorium than they do in a discussion class, right? How many of you are discussion teachers? You like to throw out questions, let them discuss. I knew you were, right? You probably struggle in a situation, I assume, like our auditorium, our auditorium, where it's just, but to have that information, because that's just the blah, 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 right? But if you put him in the situation where he can discuss, does a lot of good things. Any questions about that? So I'm going to recap teachers. I think that's all I've got on teachers. Nope. Oh, yeah, for some of our rooms. Help the teachers create an environment for kids and families want to be. I'm sorry they're not bigger. Okay. I'm going to turn around. This is our twos Bible class. Looking at the walls, what do you think they're studying? Web fiction. Jonah, but close enough. So we've got Jonah on the left. What do you see on the big wall? I brought in a, one of our members who's a really good artist. I said, I want the seven days of creation painted on a wall. He did that. I have told everyone, don't you ever touch my wall. That is going to be there until I'm dead, okay? Leave my wall alone, okay? This, on the bottom, that is our classroom for our toddlers, okay? Does this have a laser on it? No, okay. Imagine my laser here. So you see those little wood chairs? Maybe I'll have those. They used to, you could get them for about $60. They've gone up to about $160. The finance deacon here? No finance deacon? Okay, we're good. All right, but those work real well. They've got little straps, and so we can put our toddlers in there and strap them kids in, and they hate it. But we're trying to get them to sit down, so that's that room. That's our teacher's workroom, okay? That's our teacher's workroom. We have two ladies, that's all they do is run that. When they took it over, we filled two dumpsters of donated items that somebody died and left us, okay? But we go through, and you'll notice, I don't know if you can tell, on the left, I built a computer workstation where they can go in, they can pull everything up, 
Uh, you've got uh, your paper rolls. You can see on the far back wall are all of the bulletin board situations assigned by season in big old Ziploc bags is basically what they are. And so as you get ready for winter quarter, you know, go to the winter section, look and see what's there. Boom, here you go. Um, you can't tell all around here are our bookcases, but everything is labeled. It is neat. It is clean. As coordinators and teachers come in, they're like, oh, this is awesome. When I first got here, this was like a storage room. Nobody wanted to go in there. And again, I haven't seen yours, so I'm not saying anything, right? But to be able to have this going on, this on the left is our high school room, okay? When a kid walks in, bam, here it is, right? It's bright, it's colors. Uh, this is a wall. We have this type of stuff all over the place, upper right corner. So as families come in, they can see kids having fun in Bible class. It's over all of our walls. They come in. It's an environment where the teacher wants to be, where the parents want to be, where the kids want to be. This is our fifth grade room. You see the little tassels dangling down there? You are wonderfully made. It's got a little desk in the back. You'll notice, you can see over here on this edge, uh, one of the things I inherited was smart boards. And so we have smart boards in all of our elementary classes, fifth grade and below. And so, well, actually fifth grade through first grade, excuse me. First, first, no, fifth grade kindergarten, fifth grade kindergarten. And so they've got that, and so it's there. But we want it to be warm. We want it to be inviting. I think I got a couple of more. Uh, this, again, is going down the hallway. Uh, that is outside of our first grade room. This, when you walk into our education wing, you can see come, learn, and grow. Three very simple words conveying a message. Look, this is what we're about. This is our mission statement, if you will. Over here, this is our three-year-old classroom. I wish I could show you all of it. It is literally the Mona Lisa of our entire building. Okay, same lady that did that, did that. Okay. Her, uh, we call him the silent coordinator, is actually her husband, right? And they come up there, and I mean, they have just worked their tail off, okay? But we want everything to be warm and inviting. Again, I feel like I need to say one more time, I haven't seen your education room. It may top this, and if so, that's awesome, right? But the point doesn't change. Make it where people want to come. Make it a place that is warm. Make it a place that's inviting. Teachers, recap, number one, make sure they have plenty of material and plenty of resources. How do you go about that? You sit down, I would get some subcommittees together. I would start with one quarter at a time at one particular grade and figure out what we're doing curriculum wise. Then I would figure out how do we embellish this? How do we make this more effective? I would be thinking technology, again, this is next one, thinking technology, how can I get a visual aids? Who is somebody in the congregation that we can pull in and help us? Baby steps. But start working on that. Two, don't assume that everyone that's here that is not teaching doesn't desire it. Train them. Train them. And I'm going to be very direct. That comes from you elders being very, very upfront about what we need in this congregation. It starts from the pulpit. It starts with the youth ministry. It takes all of you. You've got to constantly be reminding people, look, man, we are really excited about our education ministry. We want to make it the best it can be because these, young, because these souls matter, right? And so you want to start training them, right? Make sure they got the resources. Make sure you got your pizza kits. Work up toward that. Um, and I feel like, at least in my experience, I have had a greater positive response and people willing to teach and be involved than what we had 10 years ago. Questions before we take a break and have another raffle? Questions about this segment? Yes, ma'am. So I will cover that next, next segment, but very good question. But to answer your question, no. Some congregations, and I can see why it's easier, everyone's studying the same lesson at the same time. I did not inherit that. I inherited a whole different situation that I'll talk about, but I know of congregations that do that, and there's some simplicity to it. Uh, but no, ours is basically kind of a stair step, kind of go over it. Go here, and then we'll go here. What is a smart board? So it is 
There is smart board software, which thank PowerPoint, but the smart board, you sync it up and it's interactive. You can literally go up and take a marker and not a marker, you take the smart board pen, big difference, smart board pen, and you can draw on it and you can, it literally is like highlighting it. Um, you can also make interactive creative games where maybe it's a scripture and you have all these words at the bottom and you've got so blank, so blank, the blank, and they've got to, they come up and use their finger and literally drag it up. And so it's extremely interactive. Uh, and so that's what it's, there's more modern stuff. I think your school teachers will tell you. I would recommend if you're looking at something like that, I would go the more modern route, but we have just spent 10 years doing it. And so the idea of, well, let's switch to something else. People are like, no, let's not, not, not yet, you know? So. <laughs> 10 years? No. <laughs> no. But so, okay. So first you got to figure out your scope and sequence. Okay. So we are going to study this on Sunday mornings. We will take Sunday morning and repeat it on Wednesday night. Okay? Because a couple of reasons. One, simplicity. Two, we have kids on Wednesday night that were not there on Sunday morning. But repetition, we found out, and we all know, is, is good. Right? So they're hearing it, and then we'll redo it. It may be a little more consolidated. But anyway, you figure that out. And then she was set there, because, again, this was one lady did all this. She actually did it all by herself. Nobody, no, the rest of us teamed up, but she is so amazing that she did it, did it. I almost said it, but I'm afraid she might listen. <laughs> anyway, but she did that. And so, but I know for a fact, for her to get to this level, I mean, literally, she's been working on it for 10 years. But yeah, here's your craft. By the way, these little plastic envelopes are wonderful. You haven't found these yet. Uh, and so she started with the lesson. She did then find a coloring sheet for warm up or cool down. And then she figured out what craft do I want to do in that. That's this packet. And then she just kept adding to. Hey, here's a visual aid. Boom. I found a book that reinforces this. Like, uh, what's those little, the little gold books? Um, golden book? Yeah. Yeah, been around forever? Yeah, those are great. We use those. Arch books is also what I'm thinking of. You're familiar with arch books? It's similar to Golden Books, it's just a little bit more modern. Uh, and you just, as you just keep looking and reevaluating your lesson year after year, you just add stuff to it. I wish I could give you a magic formula, but blood, sweat, tears. No, I am going to talk about one that I recommend. Do y'all have a set curriculum? Yes? Okay, good. Okay. Some places don't. They don't. I'm going to talk about one that we use for two of our grades. So. But very good question. Any other questions before we take a break? If you have questions, I'm here. And so, 10 minutes? 10 minute break? I'm on time, I didn't look. Okay. <laughs> 